the one and only Milton Greep from ICV2. Hi, Milton. Hey, Dan. How you doing? Doing great. Really great to have you on the show. Um, thanks for making the time for this. My pleasure. So I'm just going to quickly look at it. Man, I, I wikipedia would you. Milton, you got a master's in sociology from University of Wisconsin. You worked BA. for Wisconsin. That's a BA. That's is oh. that right? Wikipedia? That's Wikipedia. This is master's. I'll have to look at that page. Boom. I'll, <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get somebody on that. All right. You got a degree. You worked for Wisconsin Independent News Distributors. Right. Uh, they got purchased by Big Rapids Comic Distributors or Distribution? Big Rapids Distribution Company, BRDC. Okay. They went out of business. You went in with your buddy, John Davis, and sort of picked the bones of that and created Capital City Distribution in 1980 at the age of 26. Is that right? That's right. Okay. So what was that like? Give me, give, give, give me the, give me the overview on that. You're 26 years old. How do you want to get the idea that you want to be a distributor when you'd never, had you ever retailed before even? Well, I'd worked for two distribution companies selling comics before, so it wasn't a new business. <clears throat> And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at Wisconsin Independent News Distributors, Wind, I'd hired John Davis, who knew probably more about the back issue market than I did. Uh, and so the two of us had also gone to Big Rapids, and we were just kind of hanging around on unemployment. And I remember John coming over to my house one day, and uh, we're in the kitchen, and he's going, hey, I think we can just, you know, we can get enough accounts probably to get off unemployment. And so that was really our goal when we started. Um, so we... Uh, Asked a few weeks, he had uh, talked to uh, Bruce Ayers from Capital City Comics in Madison, and he agreed to buy from us. And uh, we talked to about a dozen of the other customers that had been buying from us at Big Rapids, and they agreed to buy from us. And uh, so then we went about getting comics, uh, which we got initially from Russ Ernst at Glenwood uh, for everything except Marvels, and we got Marvels Direct. So this was 1980. Right. I mean, if you don't mind getting into details at all, like what what, what is that? What is an operation like that worth in 1980? Like, what are we talking about to like get started as a distributor? Like, just ballpark figure me. Uh, you mean how much money? Yeah. Over oh, sales, like uh, I don't know. That first year was maybe a million bucks, something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Not uh, huge. No, not at all. And um, in fact, it may even have been less than that. And uh, we took orders on one piece of paper. There would, on the front side, we'd list all the comics that were coming out the next in you know, two months. Uh, Marvels took up one column. DCs took up about three quarters of the other column. And then we had some Warren magazines and Archie's down at the bottom to fill out that column. Then on the back, we had what we called standing draws. That's a magazine distribution term, which just means you get the same number every issue. So that's where we put yeah. magazines, which at the time would have included things like National Lampoon and Heavy Metal. Um, and uh, oh, some fanzines, early fanzines, uh, and uh, so you so, would do those in lots, not not individually ordered. They were ordered in lots. Is that what you mean? Uh, when you said standing, or, when you said standing yeah, order, it means you get the same amount every month. So if yeah. you had a standing draw on Comics Journal or whatever it was, you'd get the same same number every issue. I see. And you could pick that number, and it was just like a just give me right. ten every. month when it comes out. I got right. it, got and it. change it, but the orders didn't change that much on that kind of stuff, so. Right, sure. But so comics, somehow, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say the comics, those orders changed every every issue. We were taking orders. They knew what the creators were. Uh, on that one piece of paper, we had the title, the price, the writer, and the artist. So they had everything they needed or that we had anyway. And didn't that, did that right there tell you like, what the direct market brought like a level of like knowledge of the product, a deeper what that, that could never come from like a newsstand operator or, or at least not most of them. Right. That was the whole concept that um, comic collectors wanted to buy first issues, which in the newsstand, they wouldn't even put out first issues sometimes because uh, they didn't know how it would sell and, Oh, what's this? I don't know how to, how to put it out. I'll just throw them away. And um, comic retailers and comic customers wanted those. So, that was a difference. And then when an artist or writer changed, uh, they'd follow that writer or artist. And that was also a big change uh, from the newsstand business. So having that information allowed them to place better orders and allowed them to buy non-returnable, which was another big change from the newsstand. Yes. Because uh, they had to know how many they were going to sell before they bought them. Right. Well, so somehow you're able to herd those cats into a business. And it, if this is still true, by 1988, <laughs> says Capital City was the largest of the comic distributors. Is that is that correct? Yes, it is. 
Okay. And then somewhere, so between Capital City and Diamond, that was over 70% of the direct market right there between the two distributors. Roughly, how did that break down between you and Diamond? Like how much bigger were was Cap City than Diamond? I'm not sure, but I do know that after uh, Diamond bought Bud, then they were ahead and they were ending up, I don't know, maybe around 45% and we were maybe 30 at that point. So before they bought Bud, maybe they were 20-ish or something like that, 20, 25. So when you say Diamond bought Bud, <clears throat> the youngsters out there, that means something totally different than it might mean to the rest of us. So when you say that, you mean he bought blood, bud plant distribution. Well, he is, from, he is from California. So Grass Valley, actually, too. So what do you know? <laughs> um, okay, so Diamond, by buying bud plant, then became slightly larger than you, somewhat larger than, than Cap City's still close or... Um, like I say, I think they were more in the forties and we were still in the thirties. So they were at least a third larger by that time. Okay. But still reasonably comparable. Right. Um, but so, okay. And then somehow though, night that was 1988. And then between 19, but from between 1988, 1996 came about the whole heroes world thing happened. We all know about that. We've talked about that on the show a lot with Steve Jeppe and other people. So we know what happened. It imploded, but when we know diamond had a choice. And they made a choice and, and they went with, I'm uh, not Diamond, I'm sorry. DC had a choice to go exclusive with one distributor, right? They could have went with Cap City. They could have went with Diamond. And in some other universe, or actually probably like many, many alternate universes somewhere, because the probabilities were, I don't know what the difference in probability was. Like you are Steve Jeppy, or you are in the place, could have been the, the, the king of comics, if you will, and the sole controller for the last 20 years of the comic industry. You ever think about that and, and think about why it didn't or what if or why? Uh, well, I mean, to some extent, everybody's always thinking about their last deal, but I've had a lot of deals since then. So uh, of course. I, spend a lot of it. Um, I guess uh, when I think about it, it's when I see things going in a different direction than I would have chosen. And um you know, I think Steve's been a good steward of the business. I think his uh, heart is definitely in the right place. He loves comics. He loves the business. He loves comic retailers. Um, but there are times when I would do something different. And right now is one of those times. Okay, great. Well, well really what prompted me to, to, to bring you in, Milton, was an article you wrote on ICV2. And that's one of those things that you did. But before we, before we get there, I'm sorry, I'm jumping out of order. So Cap Cities uh, purchased. By, by Jeppy and, 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 and Diamond, got absorbed. Now that was the market. You went into consulting and then you were part of Next Planet Over, right? An early right. online comic and games re, uh, pop retail, culture retailer, whatever you want to call them. A little bit controversial. Why, you want to like just give us a like a quick topic about that and why that might have been um, a sore th thing to some retailers and other people? Um, well, it was... Uh originally founded by two uh, Wharton MBAs. Um, and that was during the dot-com boom, uh, sort of the first explosion of online businesses. So uh, money was relatively easy to raise. Uh, I helped them finish their first angel round and their first venture round and um, served as an outside chairman and advisor. And uh, um, the business model was uh, an e-commerce store. Uh, we also had content and community, uh, but we actually got uh, made an arrangement with Diamond to ship orders to consumers on our behalf. And uh, that was kind of based on the Amazon model, which at the time was selling books and having Ingram distribution uh, ship them to consumers on their behalf. So some similarities there. Okay. Um, so there was a little bit of, uh, of, of bitterness that some retailers say maybe Diamond was going to ship directly in competition to their clients. Maybe there was a conflict of interest. Um, either way, it didn't really last too long. What, what, what went wrong with ne Next Planner Over, if you could sum it up? Well, the timing was, uh, so we started in business um, summer of 99. Uh, we were running off our first venture round, time to raise the second round, early 2000. Stock market for dot-coms crashed. That meant exit path changed. So VC money dried up. Uh, so we had to sell. So we okay. sold the bones to a company called eHobbies, covered all the debt, but the equity got washed. Okay. And since then, you went and founded ICV2 uh, in 2001. 
Uh, it's a it's a it's an online uh, newsletter community for hobbies, comics, and games retailers. You put out an annual white paper about the sales of comics. Um, uh, there's a there's a paid like pro subscription plan, which I just signed up for a for a year subscription. You right. retailers out there and retail types should sign up for one too. It's a pretty good deal for the amount of info. What kind of tell 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 the people what do they get out of a hundred dollar a year subscription to ICB two? Well, uh, it allows us to expand our content in ways we couldn't do without the pro subscription. So um, part of it is data driven. Uh, we built a database that goes back about 20 years of uh, all of the diamond numbers, uh, which we reverse engineer from their indexes. And uh, so there's 20 years of comics data available. You can search by title. You can look at a graph of sales over time. You can look at titles, uh, different titles based on uh, or tied to the same character. And uh, so that's a useful tool. Uh, it also has all our magazine content, which is where we do a lot of our feature writing and our in-depth analysis. Uh, so that's available there, uh, which is not always available online. Um, we have a deal with NPD uh, to publish actual book scan numbers for graphic novels every month, the bestsellers. Uh, so on the public site, we publish a ranking, but you can know how many copies of um, Killing Joke, which is still selling, sold in December of uh, 2019 using that. And then we create content specifically for uh, the pro site. Uh, some things we do are channel checks where we'll go around and look at the chains. You know, what do the displays look like in Barnes and Noble? What do the displays look like at Walmart? Yeah. What do they look like at Target? Um, and a lot of people find that useful. And then I'll do writing specifically for the um, for the uh, pro site. Uh, over the last few months during the COVID crisis, I've been putting that kind of stuff online just as sort of a service to help people maybe get a better understanding of what this crisis is about and how to respond to it. At some point in the next month or two, we'll start taking that stuff back back behind the paywall. Right. Well, you wrote a, a really interesting article about, you know, where we go and the future of, uh, of ordering stuff, right? I mean, we've talked on this show about previews before and how you were one of the creators of an early, the early precursors to previews and those one sheet catalogs you mentioned and that expanded into in internal con correspondence i guess was part that part commentary or or, or um uh business analysis uh, um yeah please well, that was separate actually uh the big thing i was talking about in, in those two columns uh was advanced comics which was the first uh consumer catalog created by a distributor so that retailers could right. use it to take orders and then place their orders to a distributor. So that started in 1988. Um, Diamond ended up doing a similar publication uh, sometime later. Uh, Steve Bond from Bud Plant, after that acquisition, helped them helped them put it together. And um, but all the key elements that are still there in previews were there. The, the order cycle was the same. Um, the uh, idea that uh, consumers would order like a week before the orders were due to the distributor and then the distributor would add up their orders and pass them on to the, to the publishers. Uh, all of those elements were there. Uh, the content side, we did include some content, but internal correspondence was actually a separate uh, magazine which had, had data about titles, how titles were selling uh, relative to each other. That's another thing that Diamond uh, adopted, the indexes that show how, for example, you know, Batman sells relative to Superman. And um, uh, that actually became ICV2, which stands for Internal Correspondence Version 2. Right. So as if that's not enough, you're also on the board. You were or are on the board of Directors of Comicsology. Uh, I was, yes. Yeah, um, five years until we sold out to Amazon. Right. Uh, uh, on the board of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Uh, right, about 15 and years. Yeah, and also on like I guess the steering committee maybe for Free Comic Book Day or whatever that's called. You're yeah, you're involved. They had, with they had one of those early on when Free Comic Book Day was new. They sort of brought a bunch of uh, people from the industry together to talk about it every year. And once they got it running smoothly, they uh, Diamond uh, just uh, carried on on their own. But during the development of the initial model, um, I was on that initial committee. Okay, folks. So those of you out there who said Milton, who? All right, this guy's got bona fides. All right, we just we just listed them. 
And he, he, when it comes to data and publishing stuff about comics, there's only one source. There's really only one place that does serious non-fan oriented commentary on the comics industry. It's ICB2. Oh, and comic book news too. Um, 